people have different perspectives and different opinions about everything. Every little bit of change makes a huge, huge difference. We're mostly all taught how to compete. We're not taught how to cooperate. So I'll just jump in and roll down the questions if that's okay. So the first question you asked was, what is your personal educational um, and what is your personal educational and professional background? So um, this is a really long story that I will try to condense. Um, so up until my early 20s, I was what they would consider an at-risk uh, student when I was a minor, and then really um, I didn't have the skills, let's just put it that way, to enter into the adult social contribution piece. Um, and in the process of this, a lot of things happen, okay, which we don't need to talk about, but it does inform my practice. So I do like to at least disclose it because it informs what I do every single day. Uh, without the trauma that I experienced as a child into my early 20s, um, I would not be successful at what I'm doing. So it, it stands to reason just to bring it up. That being said, um, I really struggled. I, I was the typical uh, adult who was told, you know, get an education, uh, pursue a career, uh, contribute to society in a, in a social economical way. And so I started my um, career in business, obtaining my undergrad in business and marketing. And I hated it. I, I hated getting up in the morning. I didn't like going to work. Uh, there was just nothing about it that for me that spoke to me. And in the process of bumping along, um, I had the opportunity to go to work for Jackson and Perkins, which they are a rose growing uh, company. And so what they do is they grow plants, roses, they harvest them and then they send them to nurseries and then the nurseries re resell them to consumers. And doing my thing, right? Running um, uh, the, the warehouses, making sure the workers are where they're supposed to be, doing my thing. And really honestly sucking the life out of me. Um, there was nothing I enjoyed about it. Mm -hmm. And the company decided, Jackson and Perkins, that they were going to conduct a two-year agricultural certificate for the migrant farm workers to kind of give them a heads up um, in getting other types of work. And they were going to conduct those classes completely in Spanish, and they were going to conduct them on the campus in Wasco. So not on the community college campus, but actually on the, the work site. And for six months, um, I helped HR organize, I helped HR plan, um, I attended all the meetings, um, even though I had to have a translator because I didn't speak Spanish. And it was the best six months of my life. It was the best six months of my life. Uh -huh. And so what happened was they hired two bilingual instructors uh, from the community college bucket. The community college paid them and certified them. And those instructors were out on Saturday morning class they order right they would go 16 weeks test if you pass the test you go the next 16 weeks and you do that till you got to the end and then you'd have an ag certificate great well as we all know plans don't go usually as they are planned <laughs> no they don't <laughs> so the monday before the saturday morning that these classes were supposed to occur by the way the company had 242 migrant farm workers mm -hmm. that were going to attend these two classes. Oh, wow. Okay. So there'd be two cohorts uh, split. Okay. Well, the Monday morning before the Saturday morning that they were scheduled to start, and you know, this is a big deal. Everybody's buzzing about it. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. One of the instructors quits. Oh, no. Right? Wow. So, um, HR is talking and they're asking around and they're trying to figure out how to do this. And basically the community college says, 
we're going to have to keep half of the people that are interested back for 16 weeks and start them in 16 weeks because we don't have an instructor and we can't get one on short notice. So I'm listening over here in the conversation mm -hmm. and I walk in the room and I said, Roberto and I, Roberto was the field supervisor. He was the only person who spoke good English and um, he was the only person I could communicate with in my native tongue. I said, we will teach the class. We'll do it. He'll be my translator. We can do it. And the community college representative says, what's your qualifications? <laughs> I said, I have five years of military experience <laughs> and a bachelor's degree in business. Right. And he goes, I'll put you on as an emergency instructor until I hire somebody. Okay. My HR manager looked at me and she said, this is over a hundred people, Dawn, that you won't know what they're saying. I said, that's okay. So for two years, Roberto and I got permission from the college and were paid from the college to teach the course. So for two years, these hundred plus farm workers stayed with us. It was exhausting. We were putting in way more hours than we should have. But what I realized was that that's what I wanted to do. So I thought, hey, I'm going to go into education. Okay. So I decided to get a master's degree in education because that's what you need to teach. Right. And I went to Portland State University and I applied for the master's in teaching program. And they denied me a seat. And I asked why. And they said, we don't believe in your references. Those were the words they used. What? I said, okay. <laughs> Who does that? I will give you more references. Uh -huh. so I went out and got more references. Mm -hmm. They denied me a seat again. Okay. This went on four times. Mm -hmm. So on the way back to the car, I make a phone call to my partner and I'm just like, I wasn't saying anything nice. Okay. And as I get to the parking garage, this gentleman in a suit and tie approaches me in the parking garage and he says, hi, my name is Rob. He goes, what's your name? And I'm looking at him like, why are you talking to me? <laughs> so I hung up the phone and I looked at him and I said, my name is Don. I said, who are you? And he goes, more importantly, he goes, why are you mad at Portland State? And so for the next two and a half hours, we made our way up to his office. And for the next two and a half hours, we had a conversation. And he actually made me feel heard and validated. He was the director of the conflict resolution department at Portland State University. Oh, wow. And he offered me a seat. He said, on one condition. And I said, what? He says, then you take all of this anger and frustration and oppression and you put it to work. Um, I said, okay. So that's how I ended up getting my master's degree in conflict resolution. And there were two peace builders. So I'm gonna jump down to your, who are your most admired peace builders and why? There are two peace builders that stood out for me at that time. Mm -hmm. The first one was Robert Gould, who was our director of our conflict resolution program. But more importantly, to put Rob into context for peace building, um, he was um, partnering with Al Jubitz, which their commitment, their really their commitment was global peace and conflict resolution. And um, they had a partnership working on the um, island of Cyprus uh, to help kind of the ethnic division mm -hmm. uh, conversations take place just to give some context of who he was and the thing that impressed me about him was that he, in the parking garage when I was triggered in many ways and mm -hmm. angry and not saying anything positive he had the ability to just engage me in conversation right and through that ability, he was able to help me see 
through awareness and through acceptance that change can happen, but it had to happen with me. It couldn't happen with the institution. Right. And that's what led me to peace building was, you know, Tom Hastings was another influential peace builder for me in the program. He ran uh, the White Feather Peace House here in Portland. The thing about Rob and Tom is they were okay with getting arrested. Um, they, were th they were okay with violence. They were okay with being confronted with violence. I'm not okay with being arrested. It, I, I'm just not. Right. So, so the thing I couldn't fit into my world in my master's program was how I could build peace without violence inflicted on me or without me being arrested because all the peace builders I knew were international peace builders. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was my struggle. So what happened was graduated with my master's degree in conflict resolution. Um, 2003. And I got approached by um, the restorative justice um, program uh, based on my work that I'd done uh, just on my thesis and my project. My thesis and my project was on interpersonal and intrapersonal conflict and how the difference is, mm -hmm. but really how people have to still engage in both systems. Right. So I thought, yeah, what, what is this restorative justice thing? And so for a few years, I studied restorative justice. And what I discovered was I wasn't good at restorative justice either because it, re it required me to be very, very confrontational. And I, it wasn't comfortable to me. I, I love conflict and chaos and I am confrontational, but in my own style. Right. So in the process of that, I ran into Kids Turn Youth Contact with a parenting education piece. But really what, you, uh, what Youth Contact Kids Turn, Kids Turn is the program, does is they help parents with emotional and adjustment issues with their children when they're going through divorce, separation, change, and custody. Mm -hmm. They serve parents with behaviors that will help the children move forward. They talk about acceptance. They talk about conflict. They talk about communication skills. And they talk about problem solving and co-parenting. And once I found that program, I was like, this is my niche. Right. I can help parents through conflict and chaos, serve their children better, and I don't have to be international about it, but my impact is, is far reaching. So that's a long answer to personal education and professional background. My primary focus is serving individuals, couples, families and organizations, through organizational change using interpersonal conflict resolution skills. Wow. Done. <laughs> what a rich background. I, I, it was like reading a novel, but you know, or listening to a novel. Um, thanks for sharing all that. I, uh, wow. It's, it's amazing how if that, uh, education master's program hadn't said no and no and no you would have taken a whole different path um yeah and probably would not have been as um well let's forget they would not have been or or would have um you you ended up where you were supposed to be and mm -hmm. i can tell you are really passionate about this so uh, yeah, i'm glad I, I, things worked out that way but it's hard, right? Because, you know, paths can be determined very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that answered what drove me to peace building, what drives me to peace building, but just to flesh it out, what drives me to peace building is individuals, right? Every single individual in a community has the opportunity to foster peace. Right. Every single one of us. And that really is my message every day to people is, we have to find a level of acceptance with where we're standing. We have to, because where we're standing is exactly where we are. Mm -hmm. We can do that. And that opens the door to opportunity. The challenge is that for most of us, when we've been pushed, 
right? Our defenses are up. And so our automatically response is not to accept it, but we have to accept it because we don't have any control for where we're standing, but we do have control over where we go from here. Right. So we have to do that. So that's kind of what drove me to peace building and what keeps me there. I mean, there are days like last week, you know, I just think to myself, there are better ways to earn money, right? <laughs> I mean, because the, sure. conflict, the conflict is high, the chaos is just out of control. Right. The generational trauma, you can see it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, stop, just stop. But I get it because even today, I practice every day telling myself, you're worthy of the mission. You're worthy of the peace building. Because even today, I, the negative self-talk can creep in, right? So, right? And we know this. So we have to work it every day. And that's, last week, though, was like, okay, I'm getting off the train. I'm going to retire. And I'm going to go live in Tahiti. Like, this is what's going to happen. But it's so important work. Other than um, you working on yourself constantly and reminding yourself why you're doing this, um, what, what, maybe what practical ways do you use to, to stay the course? Because it is hard. You're dealing with so much. Um, and you have the option to get off the train, like you said. Right. What, what keeps you on? Like, you know, a lot of people have asked me this question, and I really think it's impact. Like, I know that when, when myself and another person works hard, and we come to a resolution, whatever that resolution is, and we can then reduce conflict and increase acceptance, and that person can move forward, in a way that reminds me of how far I've moved forward. But more importantly than that, I know that by changing that one person, their trajectory, we have now affected everybody that follows them. Right, right. It, it will share that experience. They'll share that experience for life. So that's what keeps me on the train is, oh yeah, some days the train is going 300 miles an hour, it's on fire, and we're all heading for a cliff. But if we can hang on, you know, research tells us 97% of conflict is resolvable. So if we think about that, if we can impact 97% of the people that we interact with every day, imagine how much peace we can build in the world. Right. That keeps me on the train. That's amazing. I actually didn't know that stat, 97%. Um, that's really good to know. Very um, motivating for yeah. newbies no. like myself. <laughs> Yeah, now that's not international conflict, right? Because international conflict's different. But for right. what I do, interpersonal conflict, 97% we can affect. Yeah, so I mean, the and challenges what, though, right? Yeah, right? and that's, um, that's what most of us are facing in interpersonal conflict. And mm -hmm. usually if we can resolve interpersonal conflict, we can resolve all the other conflicts because a lot of right. the time, it all comes from, you know, those closer um, relationships that we're not dealing with uh, or we're not facing um, in the right. right way. Right. Wow. Yeah, I, had, I had a long conversation yesterday about um, healthy relationships, right? Because one of the things I teach my teens is choosing a healthy relationship means sometimes letting them go. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. And we know this. I mean, this is basically healthy relationship fundamentals 101. But that piece of letting them go, I mean, you might as well be asking somebody to eat glass, right? <laughs> and, and I look at my teens and I go, okay, wait, wait, let's revisit this. You just told me all the ways this is unhealthy and all the ways this isn't helping. Right. And they're like, yeah, but I can't let them go, Don. And I'm like, but you can you have to, because if you don't, you can't move forward. You're caught in the conflict resolution trap, I like to say. And they're like, I know, it makes sense, but I just can't. And it's like, but if you could, then everything else after that becomes better. Right. Right? right. Yeah. But it's hard. That takes some effort. Um, it takes some effort, but I, I, I agree. Sometimes it's what you need to do. Um, do you ever... 
so I'm, I'm learning all, all the different approaches to conflict resolution now. I'm a uh, first year PhD student. I don't know much about um, the theories and the methods and all the, uh, all the details of it. I'm learning and I'm enjoying each class. It, it's also energizing and speaking to you is, is, is like inspirational, just so you know. Um, but one thing I've learned so far is that as a conflict resolution specialist or as a peace builder, you are not resolving a conflict for people. You are helping them through the right. process for them to realize what they need to do. Um, do you ever find that sharing your story with them helps or is that something that doesn't happen? Um, do you ever bring up personal experiences to see if that can inspire the, uh, the right approach for the person you're working with? So this, I think this is probably the hardest piece of what we do. Just, so just thinking people, and by the way, congratulations on your PhD program. I, I completed my uh, dual uh, doctorate program and I was just beyond the moon and then like, I'm done. I can't do any more education. Oh, wow. But, congratulations to you too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you're pursuing it because it's a great field. Um, so I just wanted to say congratulations, but you know, this is a hard question. Um, and when I'm training new mediators, this is a hard question because for some people, they need to hear your story, right? They need to know that you've had a similar experience to them so that you're not greater than them, right? You're not judging them. Right. However, other people, i.e. Dawn, <laughs> who come from a low trust, right? We're, we're low trust or no trust. Uh, due to trauma, um, you immediately start sharing personal details or a story, it actually shuts us down. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's people all along the continuum, but that's just two extremes. So when I'm training new mediators, I tell them, you ha and I know this sounds cliche, you have to be able to read the room. You have to be able to read who you're working with. And they're like, well, Dawn, how do I know that? And I said, people tell you pretty quickly if they trust and pretty quickly if they have trauma mm -hmm. and they're like, what do you mean? And I said, in two minutes, I can ascertain who I'm talking to, but it's because I've been doing this for 17 years. Right. You have to get there now. So you don't know, you don't know how to read the room. Great. Then just listen because they're going to tell you now. If you're listening and you get 10 or 15 minutes into the conversation and you're thinking in your head, uh oh, I should have told a personal experience about this. It's not too late. It's not too late, but you can't interrupt. You have to let them finish and then you can ask. And I said, I always ask. I'm telling you, I always ask. I say to people, well, I really appreciate you sharing your story. I had a similar experience. Would it help to compare? Right. No? Great. Doesn't hurt my feelings. Right. Right? Okay, and I've had people say to me, can you just share this piece? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got to read the room. Right. I think it is important to read the room, but also um, I hadn't thought of um, asking if a personal experience would help the person, but I can see why that would be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, one thing that I'm learning and, and seeing in all my interactions since I started this program is that um, you can't just assume anything. Um, right. You can't assume anything. You have to, to listen and listen well and, um, you know, take cues from, from, from the people in the room. Um, and it's hard. Yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine. I'm not in the, those spaces yet. <laughs> so um, I, I, hard. I can't see how hard it can be. But I think, I mean, how long have you been doing this now? So I have been involved in some type of peace building conflict resolution work since 2001. And, and I screw up. I mean, there are days 
you know, that I'm not, I'm not the peace builder I want to be. I mean, that's the other piece of this, right? Is we're humans. We, right. we've had human experiences. We have human trauma. We have triggers. We have biases. Right. Um, you know, so that's the other piece to what you're saying is the other piece to good peace building work, I think, is to recognize that you're human, that you, you're going to make an assumption. You're going to judge. Um, and if you don't, if you can't be honest with yourself about that, your work will never, never take off. Right. Um, and people need to hear that. Do you know what I mean? Like I had a mediator I was training a few months back. She's not going to work as a mediator at the court. She's not going to make it. A participant asked her in a training, you know, so you're sitting here and you're talking to me about actively listening with my kids. So you're judging me. You're assuming that I'm not actively listening with my kids. And to be honest with you, that's how the curriculum comes off. It comes off as you're doing all these things wrong. Mm -hmm. So we're going to tell you how to do everything right. right. Um, and it's a fair question. Like we have lots of people ask it in different ways. And she immediately got defensive. And she said, well, if you're not here to listen to the curriculum, then why are you here? And it's like, whoa, whoa. stop. <laughs> right? And so I tried to talk to her afterwards. I said, wait, 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 whoa. I said, we can't get defensive ever. I said, we can't. I said, it's not personal. It's this person has to challenge with the curriculum. They have a right to have a challenge with the curriculum. You should engage them in conversation, hear what they have to say. She goes, oh, no. She goes, I'm just here to teach them, and they're going to listen to me. Um, no. Um, what would you have said if that question was directed at you? Um, it really depends on the participant. This particular participant, I could tell, came into the, the Zoom meeting with low acceptance and high conflict. He actually said in introduction, so we have them introduce themselves, you know, just give their name, how many kids they're parenting. And he actually said, I'm not giving you my name. You don't need to know it. And you don't need to know how many kids I'm parenting. And I thought, oh, I need to talk to you. You're like my favorite person. Really, truly high conflict and high chaos is where I thrive. And so when he brought this up about the curriculum, my response to him would have been absolutely agree with you. The curriculum does come off as if it's telling you how to parent, but this is not a parenting class. This is a communication class. So could you help me understand how we're going to teach this in a communication way? Now I did have a participant one time where I just simply, I mean, she was really being kind of like just difficult. <laughs> so I said, please help me understand what your definition of active listening is. And she told me, and then I said, great. Could you give me some examples of how you apply that every day? Mm -hmm. And then she got quiet and she said, why? Well, I don't want to share that. And I said, okay, that's okay. I said, I'll give a couple of examples of how I apply it. And then after class, they fill out a survey. <laughs> she filled out a survey and she said, well, I didn't appreciate the way Don talked to me. However, I now understand I'm not actively listening. <laughs> And it's like, I'm good. I, I don't, I, I'll pay it as long as you're going to listen to your kids. I'm good. Like, I'm okay. Right. But okay. it's not personal. Mm. It's not personal. Right. 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 And then you, you are, you are dealing with the hardest, what I think is one of the hardest times in a parent's life, um, them facing their teenage years. Um, <laughs> So it's, I'm sure you face a lot of those, but um, oh. it sounds like you, you have really found your, your way in it, um, you have yeah. found your, your way of dealing with it. And I, I think that's really helpful. So um, yeah. Yeah, I'm learning so much from you. That's um, good. That's good. <laughs> so, so if you didn't catch it, my strategy to resolving conflict is always interpersonal first. I start with explaining, asking questions, seeking to understand, um, lots and lots and lots of active listening. And I do that even in consulting. Like when I go to organizations and I consult, it's the same thing. I need to truly, fully understand what we're talking about before I can even start to apply anything. I, I just admire it. You, 
question. If if people at the master's level were saying you're not worthy of 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 a, a, a position in in their program, and here you are changing lives every day, it's it's just ah, uh, it's amazing. But it speaks to what we do, right? I mean, like you know, you asked the question, right? How do you stay on the train? Well, when you're told no, right? I mean, I didn't know this at the time, but now that I've moved forward 17 years, I can tell you, you know, I tell my teens all the time, you're going to be told no. You're going to be told that because of your background or your childhood or your parents or where you lived or where you grew up or the car you drove, that you can't do something. And you're going to have to ask yourself the question, right? Am I going to push or am I not going to push? And I said, I don't know. I will tell you from my experience, I don't push anymore. And they're like, what? Yeah, you sound mean. Why don't you push? I said, because pushing only results in me getting a headache. What I do is truly start to understand why you're holding me back and then start getting you to change. Because once you change, you'll open the door. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, so I said, let's take bullying, for example. I said, do you truly understand why a bully is bullying? Because they're mean. I said, really? Did you ask them? Why would I ask them anything? I said, that's what I'm talking about. I said, if a bully hits you, your natural response is to hit back. Right? I said, okay. I said, so they hit you, you hit them. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to hit me again. <laughs> I said, and so we just keep this pattern up. I hit you, you hit me, I hit you, right. you hit me. Right? And it doesn't matter if it's social media or not, right? You post right. something mm -hmm. mean on social media, then I post back, and then you post something, then I post back. And I said, do we get anywhere? Well, we respond. I said, yes, but do we get anywhere? No. I said, now, let's just take a step back. I said, I post something on social media that's mean and you don't respond. That doesn't feel right, Don. Well, just stay with me for a minute. You don't respond. I said, then they post something more ugly because you know that's what's going to happen. I said, you're still not going to respond. It doesn't feel right. I said, now what you're going to do is you're going to private message them. And I said, you're going to say these words specifically these words what can i do for you no we're not as a try it so i one teen one time was having a social media battle with one of her best friends mm -hmm. over a boyfriend oh god <laughs> you know how that's gonna go right and really it's the boyfriend that should be thrown under the bus not the two girls right but okay i'm not gonna go there so she posed to her best friend, what can I do for you? And her best friend said, what? She goes, I was told to ask you what I can do for you. She goes, you can not see my boyfriend anymore. So she sent me a message and she goes, now what do I say? I say, you, you say, okay, that's fine. I won't see him anymore, but I don't want to do that. And I said, listen, we're going to talk about your choices separately from hers. But I said, you're okay with that. Okay, make that, make that compromise. No. Okay. When you decide to make the compromise, make the compromise. So about three weeks later, she came back and she goes, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what? She goes, no, you're just not going to believe it. She goes, I thought if I told her that she could have the boyfriend and she would take the boyfriend and they'd run away together. Okay. That's fair. That's what a teenager would think. Right. She goes, well, when I said it and I was mad at you for saying it, she goes, then she says she doesn't want him. <laughs> and I said, that's what we call in chess a checkmate. I said, see, I said, people want to hear their own words. So that's it. So they want to hear their own words. They say to you, I want the boyfriend. You say to them, you want the boyfriend? You can have him. 
They just want to hear their own words. She goes, yeah, well, now you're not going to really believe what happened. She goes, so we both dumped him, and now we're back speaking to each other. <laughs> team brain, right? Now, I wouldn't have done that with an adult, but team brain. And I'm like, okay. So unhealthy relationship boyfriend is not salvageable. You need to lop it off and let it go. Healthy relationship, two best friends, been best friends for 10 years. Healthy relationship, need to stay together, right? Team brain. Um, oh man, those teens are lucky to have you in their life. Some days though, I tell you, some days I just want to take them outside and just, <laughs> what I really like to do is be able to transport them forward in time. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like forward 10 or 15 years so that they could see, uh -huh. you know, that a lot of it doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> but it's okay. They'll grow up. They'll grow up. Uh, <laughs> So do you, I guess one of the questions we haven't talked about is, um, do you have a long-term vision for your peace building career? No. Or have you arrived? You know, I, I don't think either. So, <laughs> uh, you know, if you'd asked me in my 20s, right, like where I'd be 10 years or 20 years forward, I mean, I don't know. Um, and I still don't know. I mean, I... I think for me, it's to continue to serve my community in the best way possible in whatever role uh, fits them. So right now that's, you know, that's peace building and that's conflict resolution and that's working with parents and, and teens and organizations. I mean, in 10 years, it might be, you know, delivering papers around the block. Um, <laughs> you'll find from working and talking to me, I, I don't, I don't do that. I just, I do today. I do what I can do in the present moment in the best way I can. And then when I wake up in the morning, hopefully I still be doing what I was doing yesterday, but if not all that, and, and I'll do something else and, and I'll be the best version of me in that. Yeah. That's a good way to look at life. Um, I, I think what for me, just to kind of put that kind of the icing on the cake, I think for me, the reason why peace building and conflict resolution work is so, I don't know, inspirational to me even today, even after so many years, is there's so many different versions of it, right? Like some of us are strictly doing consulting work. Some of us are doing trench work, right? Every day where we get out and we're actually on the front lines. Um, you know, some of us have like, you know, I've gotten into my specialty of, you know, high chaos and high conflict and low acceptance work, you know, and everything in between, right? We have people who are blogging about conflict resolution practices. We have people who are teaching. Um, people who are actually working in systems uh, to get change, you know, from the inside out. I mean, it's just an amazing um, kind of field, you know, like if you go into nuclear engineering, you pretty much know what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, right? But mm -hmm. for peace builders, I mean, we could be doing something different, you know, every day of the week if we wanted to, um, using the same set of skills, just changing it to match the environment or the conflict that's going on in the room. And I think that's just amazing to talk about as far as experience, the, the ability uh, to do that, to transform, to one, you know, one second be consulting, the next second be in the trenches and actually resolving, mm -hmm. to work with people on transformational change or to work with systems on being less oppressive or being more diverse. I mean, that's just, now it made me tired, but it's just an amazing place to be, right? Because if you right. go into one section and you don't like it, it's very easy to take your skill set to another section. So mm -hmm. yeah. anyway. I think I like that about it too. Um, the interdisciplinary um, aspect mm -hmm. of it. Um, yeah. It, it, I, I'd like to do international conflict, but um, I'm sure at some point I'll also be doing, you know, organization or interpersonal mm -hmm. um, just because I, I, I like change. I like to um, I like to to switch things up every once in a while. So um, it's really exciting. Um, I know you've shared a lot of um, wisdoms about uh, the field and 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 what 
um, what makes it work for you. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to add um, for people watching or reading about your work or peace building in general? Um, something they can take away, uh, those who are interested in, in the field um, and pretty much know nothing about it. Um, or people who are pursuing it but aren't as experienced as you are. What, what, what else would you um, tell them? That, that is a great question. I think what I would tell people is peace building, conflict resolution work really is a soul's mission. Um, you have to, when you're engaging in the work, you have to do it with your whole heart and soul. Not one part of you can be sitting on the fence. Um, and you have to do it in a genuine and caring way. Um, you cannot go into this type of work without full commitment, without full intention. Um, and that being said, you have to remember that you're involved in this process too. So, you know, peace building is going to bring up uh, past trauma. Um, it's going to bring up um, past social, economic, academic, uh, parental stuff. And you have to have a way to take care of yourself. Um, your, the people that you serve, and I use that term, the people that you serve, um, can't have you adding baggage. Um, they've, they've found themselves either by seeking you out or by you seeking them out. And they need your whole commitment to them. And that can be challenging for new peace builders because, um, you know, sometimes we like to hit the ground running right. um, and not necessarily take care of ourselves. You have to take care of yourself, um, especially if you're dealing with high conflict and low acceptance uh, because you can burn out really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's what I would say. You know, I, I always, when I'm training new mediators, I tell them, if you're not bringing your whole heart and your whole soul to work, and this isn't truly your calling, then, then it's not going to work because people come at you, you know, my parents, I mean, we could talk about them for, for weeks, right? I mean, you just think about, I always tell peace builders, like, just think about four of your friends. Mm -hmm. And if you all had a conflict between each other, the, the skill set that you're going to need for each one of those friends is very different. Now take that to a company of 500 employees or take that to um, a provider that's giving you 250 people to talk about, you know, self-care. I mean, each one of those people is going to require a different approach. And so if you're not fully intentionally there, mm -hmm. you're going to miss it. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Um, this is amazing this is probably one of the fields that I talk up the most because the work is so rewarding. Um, you know, it's the ripple in the pond effect is what I always say to peace builders is we may not see the end result, but our job is to create as many ripples in the pond as we can. Um, and to have really blind faith in that those ripples at some point are going to create waves and change. Very few of us get to see the true end result of what we do completely um so you have to be intentional and you have to bring your whole self to work and i think that's hard i think that's a hard ask right right you know yeah, definitely um thanks for the um the wisdom i think it's um it's true it's it's i i like how you put it it's the, it's the work of your soul um and mm -hmm. i think you have to really be dedicated um, yeah. and I am glad there are people like you who are um, because it does make a difference I'm, I'm sure you um, if you look back at all the families you've worked with um, you can see an impact so um, thanks again for taking the time um, to oh, speak with thank me you. I am so glad we finally got to talk I would have been missed 
I would have missed so much if we hadn't been able to um, to make our schedules work. So I'm glad we did. Um, you know, if somehow, somewhere we um, get to work together um, at some point, it will be just as inspirational as this interview was. Yeah. Well, thank you, and, and likewise. I mean, I think I think we could we could take over the world. So maybe we should organize to do that. Yeah, let's do it. Thank you.